Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to welcome you all here. It's now um, the, um, let's see, it's the 8th of February, and you're looking at my screen where you can see we have a discussion coming up about open green math. Um, we wanted to, we thought we'd start today with everybody introducing themselves very briefly, your name, where you are. Are you already using open green map? and include five words about the map that you want to make. And I'll stop sharing for this. Okay. So who wants to go first? <laughs> how about if I call on people? Um, Mary, how about you? Sure. Um, I'm using Open Green Map for um, three different projects here in town. So in our town, I'm in Port Townsend, which is a small little peninsula, so a very defined area. And I have one for the entire food system for the area for local growing local food. So everybody can see how everybody else works the place together. One for just the food bank guards themselves and one for a sustainability group that has everything that you can use on Green Map. It's great. How about Ken? What about you? Sure. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm a, a part of a, a a collective called the Map Shop at the University of Victoria in the Geography Department, and have been involved in community mapping for a couple of decades, and and with the Green Map uh, system, and uh, we have a community mapping class, and have started to use now the new Open Green Map in in a couple of those projects, and I see we've got a couple of good friends here that uh, hopefully they'll uh, they'll tell you a little bit about what they're up to with their project but yeah we're kind of wanting it to be one of the tools that the students can use in these uh, community engaged action-based learning and teaching projects okay. how many people are here from victoria cool that's great and um gabe why don't you go ahead and we're doing great on keeping this fast so let's okay so in Victoria, there's also, besides Ken and Laurie and myself, there's also Catherine, who you, whose face you can't see there too. Um, I'm not using the map personally. Laurie will speak about that. There's Catherine. Um, but uh, I am on the board of the community association and um, the communications coordinator in our area. And we're looking at, uh, what I've suggested, we look at how we use uh, mapping as a tool in our communications in a, a range of projects. So building some skill in the neighborhoods around mapping. And we've been working with Ken and I met you, Wendy, many years ago. Yeah. I kind of remember you, Gabe. Thank you. <laughs> How about you, Lori? Let's continue with Victorians. Uh, yes, my mic is on. Um, we're working with Ken and Malia's class of uh, community mapping students, and we're developing a pollinator map for the Gorge Tilikum area. Yes. So it's getting started, and it's a lovely project, and people are starting to talk about it and ask about it, and what's going on? And so it's at the beginning class. I think we've gone, um, had four groups of students working on it, and it's just rippling out nicely. It's lovely. So thank wow. you for your help, because I think you've been involved in that too. You and Ken. Um, a little, a little, but um, thank you. And, you know, we love pollinators and Bogdan and Alexandra from the GIS Collective have been working on a map just about that. But let's keep going with introductions and we'll touch back on that. Catherine, how about you, since you're the last Victorian here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Yes, hi. Hi, I'm Catherine Brent, and I am on the Gorge Tilikum Community Association. And I have not actually been involved in any community mapping as of yet, so I'm very interested in this. I did study landscape architecture at the University of Guelph, where graphic communication is a major part. So I, over the years, have done a lot of graphic communication drawing, hand drawing, and computer-based AutoCAD produced drawings. So I'm, I'm studying those types of presentations. Great. Well, that, thank you. How about Brett? Brett, yeah, you be the one New Yorker in the room that I recognize. Hi, yes. Hi, it's glad, I'm glad to be here, Wendy. Um, I, I'm not working with Green Map System right now, but I have in the past. I've worked with Wendy. I teach at Parsons School of Design, and I have so many students interested in sustainability and particularly community rooted projects. So this is why I'm always trying to track what is happening with Green Map System to see how I might introduce that to students. So I'd be happy great. 
do more with you, of course, anytime. And, you know, with the Victorian example is amazing and years long, so rich. I see Dan in the room too, another American. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a professor down at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, I'm the PI on something called SCAPE, which is a curriculum for water quality. And Bogdan and Alexandra have been helping me just in super significant ways in the development of a, an app uh, for actually uploading data from the field to um, a map-based uh, kind of database, if you will, spatialized data. And my five words. Oh, somebody part remembered. Part participatory, community-based, well-designed, shareable, collaborative. Maybe that was six. <laughs> Six is good. That's excellent. Thank you so much. I see we have a bunch of people from Scotland in the room. Claire, do you want to go first? I'm Neil. Uh, I'm from. Uh, I'm actually from England, not Scotland. <gasps> so, um, but that's that's fine. I don't mind. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm based in uh, Norfolk, which is like the East Coast. Like we stick out. Um, and I'm not using Green Map at the moment, but um, I'm, I'm currently studying an eco literacy course with um, a lady called Kathy, um, who's Irish. And uh, as part of the curriculum, uh, we were looking into uh, mapping, and this came up as, as like something to like look into. Um, so I'm particularly interested in um, uh, sustainability um, and building community. And so I'm kind of hoping that I'm going to get the jump on everybody else in the UK and I'm going to figure out what this green map is all about. And then, uh, yeah, and I, <laughs> I'm going to be ahead of the curve. Love it. That's great. Thank you. Neil, how about you? Uh, evening, afternoon and morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Neil from Glasgow Eco Trust. Uh, we've been involved with green maps. Uh, well, I've been involved with Wendy and Green Maps for about 15 years. Um, so we've got our own community map for the west of Glasgow. Um, we've also developed some for we've got uh, we do health walks and lead cycle rides. Um, so we've we've mapped the routes of those uh, those rides, um, and we're looking to expand that. We're also uh, we were involved with uh, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland and their Climate Fringe to develop a Glasgow green map for COP twenty six, and we're currently holding that. As a, as a kind of legacy and in discussions with a variety of people and organizations as to where that goes. Um, we're also looking at uh, a couple of other maps, <clears throat> one in terms of um, foraging um, and food growing, and another one, um, there's a lot of policy talk in, in Glasgow and Scotland at the moment around low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, 20 minute neighborhoods, livable neighborhoods, all this kind of stuff. So we're looking at how we can use the map to, to assist that, to help communities get on the front foot and be a bit proactive rather than waiting for these things to, to happen to them when the, when the council decides. In terms of five words, I've got um, engaging, user-friendly, inspiring, uh, colorful, and uh, I think potential. Potential, love it. That's great. And um, we'll hear more, a little bit more from Dan later because um, things are fresh from Glasgow. And let's hear from David, who maybe already is working with Neil. Maybe not. Yes, it's great to see Neil. And thank you for um, looping me into this meeting, Neil. Um, I'm on the board of uh, Stop Climate, so, sorry, um, Scottish Communities Climate Action Network, um, which is um, members all over Scotland. Um, and uh, as a sort of community-led local initiative, uh, local initiatives, um, we use the, map, the term mapping in metaphorically as well as uh, geographically. Um, so, so this is a, a, a double way of, of, of evidencing how people can, can um, uh, collaborate geographically. Um, we're um, being funded with a small grants from Scottish government uh, to develop 10 regional community climate action networks. Um, there's already a couple well established uh, in Fife, um, in Northeast Scotland around Aberdeen and so on. And um, we're thinking to, that, that uh, this mapping tool, which Neil and, and colleagues in Glasgow, especially around COP, 
um, for the for the climate fringe for the COP26 um, used as a way of um, um, uh, linking people together. Well, having been there for the climate conference, I have to say I'm ready to come back. I got the hat. Okay, mm -hmm. Deb. Deb, I know you're in uh, New Jersey. Hop in. Do you want to introduce yourself briefly? And then we have Mary Lou, and then we'll begin. You're on mute, Deb. Okay, we'll hey, come there. back. Good. So, yeah. Is that all right? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. You hear me fine. Thank you. So, um, yes, I'm in Jersey City. I am the founder of Sustainable Jersey City. Um, I've been a fan of Green Map for a long time. We had used it some years ago. We're now um, actually moved in the direction of we were recently gifted um, with an enterprise version of ArcGIS. And we're trying to, with our cadre of GIS users, um, create some story maps. And it's always interesting to look at other platforms to see um, what could be most useful to the public. So that's why I'm tuned in today. Thank you. That's great. How about you, Mary Lou? Where are you from? Oh, hey, I'm on my phone. Sorry. Um don't have my video on. I'm from Vancouver, BC, Canada, and I'm really just here to learn, working with various, um, I should say, volunteering with various um, groups here that are trying to get initiatives. And it seems like mapping is such a powerful way to communicate. So interested in learning more. Thank you. That's great. And I see Isabel has joined us. So um, Hello, y'all. Um, I also can't stay very long. I just wanted to check in and see what you guys are doing. I'm from uh, Venice, California, and made a green map um, in 1999 and uh, did a reboot of it in uh, 2000 and something. And we've been planting a lot of trees. So I'm interested in may maybe trying to develop a tree map. Thanks. That's great. So I love hearing all this these different things that people are ready to work on um, with and already working on. And I hope that um, we'll um, be able to um, share some more ideas while we're going on. So let me start and I'll begin with a little quickie slideshow. I think most of you have the basic demo that I mean, basic idea. We've been around for about 30 years now, folks. Oh my goodness. And it's screen mapping is spread to 65 countries. It's all locally led by different kinds of sectors, but most, most maps are involving the public. And what we're doing is we're connecting the project, sharing strategies, building tools. And I'm so glad to be working with Alexandra and Bogdan, who the three of us didn't introduce ourselves during the intro, but we will. Um, they're based in Berlin and have been brilliantly working on the new mapping platform that you're gonna see that's the focus of today. But just want you to know, we have these other tools available for engaging, experimenting, exploring, um, and for making print maps and all kinds of multimedia things. Everything's linked by the green map icons, which is a set of 170 that we've built up over the years. We're testing a new food base set. You can use um, just a few of the icons if you want. For example, this is some of the climate icons and it's climate change that really encouraged us to open our toolkit to all. So since 2018, we've been open source. And so these tools are free for all but uh, commercial users. Um, and we've also with the new platform, Open Green Map 2, and I'll just call it Open Green Map here. Um, we're really lucky that you can also add your own icons to it. So it opens the door for all kinds of things. So for today, I just thought I'd include some of the experiences I had in, in um, the UK in the fall as a lens through which we can see how this platform is used in different places. So let me first take you to uh, Cornwall, England. And I have a 30 second video here. Let's see if it works. Oops. Oh, I'm not in share mode. One moment. Oops, sorry. I forgot to do that. 
Okay. So the sound isn't very loud, um, but you can get a sense of place from it and how rich it is. And this is a good example of a place that has handmade maps that haven't been digitized. And it also has a new generation that sees things differently. So, oh, sorry, let me try and break this. Uh, escape. All right. So it's experiential. It's 600 years of history um, under your feet. It's talking with community members who might be 86 years old or six years old. And it's pulling all this richness into a map that's really trying to influence policy. This land that they're walking is about to be delisted as public space. How do you protect it? Well, bring people, including the decision makers down there. And they're in, they were in the space while that happened. So I'm looking forward to that project. Here's Danoon, which is in the west coast of Scotland. It's west of Glasgow, where um, Hannah Clinch brought together um, groups from around the whole peninsula to work together. And instead of focusing on the technology in this workshop setting, we focused on the uh, exchange. What happens when you start to discuss the merits of different kinds of places with people from different perspectives? So getting people around the table, hearing from them, this is where you really start to build your local knowledge, networks, and, and capacities for um, sustainable change. So Hannah's been doing a lot of different kinds of things, including, um, as you can see on the lower uh, left, mapping heritage. So one of the things there that's very important are these beach huts. And the mapping is part of let's figure out where to site them. But we got out in the woods, we got to the shore. And another thing that we got to do together with um, the GIS Collective is take a deep dive into the future of green map in the sky through the Scottish con uh, context and that work is continuing. Um, so there were tons of meetings and gatherings and um, even a BBC broadcast about green map and great opportunity to work with um, people from different parts of the world in person or people local like Enid on the lower left who created a green map many years ago and is now with the Coalfields Trust and starting to work with us and um, a whole group of um, communities where there's long-term unemployment and long-term pollution to deal with. And how many of our countries have the same issue writ large in a different way? We're, at, we're really at a turning point and we really feel our tools can really help people bring all these things together. There's Neil in the center, by the way, at one of the business uh, discussions there, but it was so great how, to, how many people could come and experience this. We also did a, a video uh, night while we were in Scotland, and these were some of the key words that came out of it with videos from Cuba, Israel, Japan, UK, and the US. And all of that, both that, that video and one with, um, Neil and Hannah focus um, is at greenmap.org slash COP26. And that page will lead you to three other pages about what got accomplished there. Um, but now, Neil, do you have want to say something ab about the um, Glasgow Green Map experience a little bit more? Yeah, so <clears throat> trying to think. So uh, Wendy mentioned uh, Hannah. So. Hannah and myself brought Wendy over to Glasgow uh, many years ago to, to, to yeah, promote the green map and then um, we got involved. So obviously with the, with the delay for COP26, um, we had discussions with uh, Kat Jones, who was the project manager for the Climate Fringe. So the Climate Fringe was um, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland's um, yeah, COP26 focused project. So Stop Climate Chaos Scotland is a is a net is a membership uh, network <clears throat> of a wide range of organisations such as Friends of the Earth Scotland and 
um, yeah, various other organizations, but quite, some quite large organizations. So they got together, um, got some funding in place to put together a small team. Um, and so I had some discussions with Kat um, about how we could use the green map um, to, I suppose, provide a, a one-stop shop, an alternative to Google Maps for people coming to COP and for people living in Glasgow or visiting Glasgow as part of that. Um, so one of the, so Stop Climate Chaos and the Climate Fringe took on a student placement, uh, Joanne, um, who did a lot of the initial work on the map. Um, and one of the features, uh, one of the new features of the Open Green Map system that we used was the campaigns. So we were able to create um, different campaigns. So this is the this is the, the screenshots from from our website, and there was similar information on the uh, Climate Fringe website. Um, again, the the ability to just embed the map within whatever websites that are there. So the campaigns worked really well. Um, because we were then able to go out and just by social media uh, encourage people to um, add, as you can see there, different different attributes that, of the city that people wanted uh, or people felt would be good. Um, so there's over 270 um, sites on the map, um, and it was used uh, through the climate climate fringe week in September, and then through into the build up um, into COP26. Um, and now the discussions are, are ongoing as to how we take that forward. Um, that's branched out into a couple of, uh, so one is around the, the legacy of the actual Glasgow Green Map itself. Um, and then with the discussions with um, David from SCAN, and there's also a, an organization called Scottish Community Alliance, which is a member of the Scottish uh, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland around whether we could create a community map for the whole of Scotland, uh, which is quite an ambitious um, task. And so there's discussions going on uh, with various organizations and people about what that might look like. Um, so yeah, so the Climate Fringe project has now finished and uh, the, the staff team has, has all been disbanded, unfortunately. So we've, we've kind of hosted the, the map as is um, in discussions about its legacy. Um, I think one other thing to mention, there was another map created, which was around um, venues around COP26. So it was specifically, uh, so there was a new set of icons that were developed, um, which were basically an adaptation of existing icons, but they had COP26 uh, along the bottom of them. Um, so that was a, that was a separate map um, just to, to provide key information about key venues and locations for events and stuff like that. And this was something I loved was the daily news blast from the climate fringe included site of the day, pick of the day. And so that was very interesting for me. And I got to actually experience many places I would not have otherwise, which is exactly what you want to happen in a case like a, having a, a, a big event like the cop come to town. I also appreciated um, so many aspects of this program, how the different groups work together. It's really great now to see COP has left. What's the legacy as Neil was saying, and how do we carry forward all the, with all the momentum that was gained there? So I'm gonna to continue to watch this project and um, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we have a lot more to learn from this project. We've already interviewed Kat. If there's other people on the team who might wanna share with us, you know, from their perspective, that could be very useful. Thank you, Neil. Hi everybody, it's me, Wendy. I've come back a couple days later because we had a technical glitch in the demonstration. It was me, I needed to refresh my browser. So if you have an issue, start there. I'm gonna start by showing you my screen, uh, sharing my screen. And <clears throat> here you can see, this is the new map we're creating for New York, all kinds of new sites. And we already have put a few sites on. I'm gonna show you quickly how to put on a few more. Let's start by showing you the map. And you can see most of our sites are right here in lower Manhattan, but I wanna add one that's over here um, along the Newtown Creek Waterfront Alliance uh, is right along Kingsland Avenue. So they are based exactly right here. I know because I've been there and I'm going to hold on my control key 
and choose propose a site. And the advantage to this is it automatically chooses the name of the map and you can quickly add um, your site name, Wildflower. And this is an incredible green roof and um, community space on the roof. And there's lots of other great things going on there like Newtown Creek Alliance. We can come back and add that later. Um, and is it in the right spot? Well, let's zoom in and make sure that we're on the exact right spot. Ah, you can see I've actually put it out in the creek, but where I wanna be is right here on this building. Okay, so we're gonna save that pin location and we've got the actual building. I'm going to add a photo that I've already uh, put into, made a screenshot of. There's the roof. And I'm going to select, in this case, a green roof icon will be our first one. And we have green roof right here. But you can also see that this is an environmental education center. Oh, there's so many things that um, are going on in this particular spot, including um, greenhouse gas reduction. This is a child-friendly space and eco-information. Here's the education piece. So let's just save those for now. And we have a few. If by chance I wanted to make one of these other icons, the primary icon, I can simply drag it into place and have it be the primary icon that shows on the map, or I can just click it. But in this case, we love that Kingsland does have a green roof. So that makes it really unique. I'm gonna hit um, submit. And this is actually a two part submission and we can go back to the map or we can go right now and view the site. And all I'm gonna do now, since I know it has everything in it, is I'm gonna make, oh, there's the picture. I'm gonna make it public. You can see that picture is a little low res. I might find a, another one later. So I've just made it public. We're gonna go look at the map and see, do we see that site? Yes, we do. Right there at Kings and Wildlands. So that's fantastic. If you click here, the, the information about it will pop right up. The picture will come in. Again, it was a large picture. So you have to balance the picture size with your load size. So find the happy medium there. Um, you can edit right from here if you're logged in, but I'm gonna close that for now and I'm gonna show you a couple other ways to add sites. Now, propose a site is up here, does the exact same thing that the one that where you click it on the map, except it doesn't know the location. You can also choose add feature. Now feature is the word that covers um, a site like we just put on, a route or an area. So in this case, we're gonna put on a Dutch Kills Loop for a site and it's an area. When again, we're gonna, this time we're gonna select the map. There's the NYC Fresh map and it brings us right in to see just that map. So I'm going to click this green um, magnifying glass and that will take me all the way in. I know I'm not so far actually from Central Park where that happened to fall. So oh, we're a little further down here and here's the Dutch Kills loop. So I'm going to click uh, geometry and I'm going to add the area. So this area and right now I'm just drawing a box so I can show you that um, you can actually edit kind of a box. All I have to do is click on this again and that blue dot reappears and I can bring it in and um, I can actually move in if I want and say, oops, I didn't mean to get all that. And I can readjust my box so I get exactly what I wanted. Um, tuck that in a little bit to get the exact right space. And you can go quite detailed in adding this, and of course, you can also upload a file that does this as well. So you don't have to do it manually. If you've got a GPX type file, that's from a Map My Ride type app, you can upload that immediately. But here, let's add this to the map. 
And now we can see there's the area and I'll show you what it looks like on the map itself. Um, oh, maybe we'll add a little note. We forgot to add a little bit about it. Um, fantastic. This is an eco uh, industrial, it's actually a bio-industrial park in the making. And I might add in this case, the URL, um, Dutch Hills Loop org, so people go and check it out. I definitely will come back and add a little more description here because this is a quite a unique site, including a perma an existing permaculture farm and um, has lots of really interesting partnerships happening. So I'll save that and I'm gonna select a couple of icons. Let's see, so under technology, actually under land use, um, under nature, let's look under land use and we have um, cleaned up or rebuilt site. We also have a, a water feature there and it's a nature corridor. So I'll just, um, make it quick and just choose those, but I could actually add quite a number of icons. We suggest somewhere around eight is probably plenty, but there's the site. You can see the dotted line right there on the map. And the, again, I want to um, make this, oops, I have to move this over just a little bit. Sorry, folks. Um, I have to edit the button and change it from private to public and save. And then we show, should be able to see this new site on the map as well. So you can see it's right here in the, um, and the, on the listings of the sites. And let's see if it shows up on the map and how it looks. So there it is right there. And it's right across from that Kingsland wildflower. That's uh, area. But if we click this, you can see the whole area lights up and you can see the project. Um, right there. Oh, I see we forgot the photo. Let's add the photo. So what's nice about this is you can add um, missing pieces to it anytime. You can update whenever you like. And um, I believe this is the correct image that I had already collected. Yes. And there's a map of the loop so people can see it more closely. We can add a sound file if we like, that's an MP3. And like I said, we can come back anytime and enhance what we have on this site. And now when we go back to the map, we can see the area and now the photo will come into the, the box on the side in just a moment. Um, so, you know, it's the first time it's loading it, so it takes just a second. You know, I'll move it over so you can see it better. There we go. So now we're starting to see more and more of the map. In this case, we've also made a um, campaign for it. And you, did you know that I could add a site from another map if I wanted to? All I have to do is click the uh, drop down box. Let me show you that one moment close that back up and reveal these tools. But um, let me go to browse for one second. I am going to choose a site. Oh, they're gonna be from all over the place. So what I might do is come back, uh, search for a certain site. So I'm, in this case, I'm gonna put in Morris, which is a local museum that's really ex uh, growing fast now to include all kinds of events. And there's Morris. And all I'm gonna do to it is I'm gonna edit it and to show you how to add it quickly to the map. So I've clicked the three dots to, um, on there to let the edit button show. And as it's loading, I'm gonna think, do I wanna add anything more to this description? What is something that's exciting and new that Morris is doing that might not yet be on that description? So um, it's coming right up. <laughs> Sorry, it's a very snowy day here. So things are running a little slowly. We use community Wi-Fi here at Green Map. We're not on a uh, major system, but there's the, the site and tells the story of the neighborhood and or offers tours, offers a popular tour and more. Um, I'm gonna say, 
always a new way So it's the Museum of Reclaimed, oops, Urban Space. And I'll save that. And then let's go down and look at the map. So right now it's only on one map. So if I click the pencil, I can add another item. And I have all my possible maps there. And I want the NYC fresh. I'm going to save that. And we are going to go back to our maps. And I'll show you a quick way to get to that map. I'm choosing my team right here. And when I choose that team, I have all my maps all on one page without their photos. So this loads very quickly, especially if you're like me and have several um, maps now. Let's see if it's on here now. Is Morris there? There it is. And I'm going to let Bogdan and Alexander talk, and we'll continue. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Berlin, right. what's nearby? Yeah, so what you see here is the iOS app that we recently released. And I will quickly go through it and show what you can do with this new app that's available on iPhones. So when you open the app, you can see the list of uh, green, green places that are nearby you. And you can click on the cards and read more details about them. You can um, browse through pictures or you can get the directions to actually go to that place. Yeah, I'm, I'm now on a simulator, probably won't work that well. <clears throat> All right. And what else you can do is also click on the map and see the same information from there. It's pretty straightforward, it's quite useful. Um, the next thing is the map section, which is loading right now. And here you can see all the public maps around you. So because we live in Berlin, you can see the green map uh, Berlin and the Berlin sun map. And if you click on it, you have a similar view with a map name, a short description and the sites that are on the map. And if you click on it, you can uh, see the same details with the icons and pictures. And this section shows the public campaigns. And here you can uh, contribute to the campaigns that uh, map makers uh, start. And right now, for example, I can show you how the uh, Berlin soundscape campaign looks like. <clears throat> and it's pretty similar with what uh, you see on the web platform. You can choose the location. You can add more details about the place, select icons, and pictures, <clears throat> or fill in some custom attributes or questions if they are set up. I won't submit this uh, form right now. And here, in, in the last uh, page, you can log in. And if you log in, you'll actually see your profile where you can upload your picture and make yourself more visible on, on the grid map platform. But this is not the only app that we contributed in the last weeks. We also worked on, on oh, yeah, there's one more thing. <laughs> uh, we also have this widget. So if you go to your iPhone's widget page, I don't think I can do this from here, but you can add this widget to your screen and you, you'll always see the closest green place um, where if you just click on it, you'll open the app and probably browse through what's nearby. Yeah, so going to the other app that we did, it was this uh, Scape Water Quality app. Uh, we helped them to um, finish this app. And this one is a more specialized one where um, people can contribute about the water quality um, attributes around uh, the Colorado reader, uh, River. Um, and here you can just go here and press start. And here you have a form that's um, also a campaign on green map 
and fill in all the fields. Um, there are quite many. Uh, you can also add observations about macroinvertebrates or read more about them if you want to see uh, what you can find on the river. Um, yeah, and then you, when you're done, you can press, uh, when you're done, you can press save and the answer is stored in a local storage because you might not have internet on the field. So you might want to submit the data once you're home and you have Wi-Fi. <clears throat> I won't send those observations right now. And yeah, on this tab, you can see the macro invertebrates that live uh, around the river and you can read more about this. And here is the short app, uh, short map. Okay, um, now I will share the browser because this form that you see in the map actually corresponds to a campaign which has um, the same fields and the macroinvertebrates as icons uh, where if you select them, you can also set the number of um, macroinvertebrates that you observed. And when you submit um, this form, all the data arrives on this green map, which is for now uh, private. Um, and you can browse through all the sites that were submitted. Now the, we only have some test data. And um, now I can talk about a new thing that we added. And you probably um, seen this new button here which is a spreadsheet view of the map data. And here you can see uh, a sheet with all the sites that are on the map uh, where you can edit it pretty easy. For example, you can add a test here. Um, you can change the position if you double click on a field or you can dive into uh, the attributes that are added to those sites and change the values from here. And let's turn this four into five. And yeah, you have this for every icon that uh, is present on the map. All right, so uh, this is how we um, integrated the Scape Water Quality app with uh, the platform. But we also added a new thing here. If you click on the search, now you have another view. If you remember the one that we had before, it was just some small, small bot buttons with some icons, but now you can actually browse through the uh, green maps icon sets. And if you click on one from here, you can see only those sites that have this icon, or maybe if you don't see um, the icon that you're interested in, you can press on this view more button and pick some other um, icon, let's say geological feature. And now you'll see on the map all of these sites. Wow. And that's what that was everything that I wanted to show. Um, I went pretty quick because we are actually looking for questions from you and feedback because this helps us a lot to develop this platform. And now back to Wendy. Oh, hi everybody. Wendy, yes? can, I, can I just say how appreciative I am of Bogdan's and Alexandra's incredible work. Uh, we, we started uh, the project at Arizona State University, but we had a non-functional kind of platform and they took it over and made it sing. So I just can't say enough how appreciative I am for Bogdan's and Alexandra's excellent work. Thank you, Dan. Um, we love them too. <laughs> They're amazing. And even though we aren't able right this second to put images up, um, they'll release something probably in the next 24 hours that will fix that issue. Um, they're incredibly responsive people. And I wonder okay. who does, 
Go we ahead. usually look for feedback on, on the platform. I will, I will share my screen again. <clears throat> so here under the question mark, you can create, click on the email a new issue and we um, will get this email and try to respond as fast as possible. Um, you can also send us suggestions and we look through all of them. We don't forget about um, the feedback and questions that we get. I think that's terrific. Um, and I wonder if there's some questions from people who've used this or have some new ideas. Uh, if I may, um, I was uh, really interested in what Neil shared. Uh, relative to the Glasgow um, map. And uh, Wendy, you had mentioned that there was updates on a daily basis, kind of like little news blasts or something like that. It was and, side of the day, yeah. Yes, and I'm wondering if there's an opportunity on this map to, to have a kind of incident reporting feature, which uh, some other platforms support, such as, I don't know if you're familiar with Ushahidi in Africa, um, and um, anyway, it, it, it allows the user to tie into a whole variety of news feeds. And so if you, and it's pretty simple to code, but you could tie into, you know, recent ecological disasters or something like that. And that would be reported as a kind of headline and link right on the site. But I, I don't know if there's interest in the idea of something that is kind of minute by minute being updated in that way. <laughs> so um, we haven't had a call for it yet, but what we do have, and let me share my screen again, is we have created the campaign tool. And I already made one for the map that I was just making called What's Fresh in New York. So a campaign lets you ask just a couple of questions of, part, of people in your community. So you could, do it for incident reporting. Um, this one is set up. I'm basically, what's the name of a new sustainable living shop or place that should be featured? What kind of place is that? That's the only questions. Just get something descriptive in its title. People can choose related icons. So the ones that come up automatically, um, say green store. And easily, as you saw, um, Wait a minute, before I say, as you saw, I'll say you as the map maker will get notified every time somebody asks and contributes a site with a campaign. And when you receive it, you can move the icons around. So you can say, okay, they chose, in this case, fair trade as the first one. That's probably the most important thing about this location. And so then you can move it to the first slot. I sometimes add, if they haven't added it already, the URL of the site. And I maybe even take a picture right from that website and, and add it up to sort of flesh out what people have contributed to the map. This idea of instance reporting, in Ushahidi's case, they went from SMS to the map. It was a very specific, uh, violence reporting tool. Um, this is not exactly what we're doing. There's so many differences there, but I did want to show you we are ready for public engagement and it's very quick to make a, um, a campaign. And Alexandra, do you want to show the new, um, here I'll stop sharing, the new um, tutorial you just created that really drills down on this question of how do you make a good campaign quickly? So it's coming right up, but. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out which, how to share my screen. Ah, okay. Um, it's at the bottom? Yeah, yeah but um, I have a lot of, um, I think I have to provide um, access, to... right? So I have to restart. Oh, well, then let me do it. But maybe, Bogdan, you can share it. or mm -hmm. And I can walk people through it if you show it on the screen. All right, I have it right here. There you go. 
Thanks. Yeah, you, you took me by surprise today. I thought it was Bogdan's demo day. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, we've been working on uh, a documentation, a, a one place where you can find uh, how to start using the platform. Uh, and we've uh, created a few tutorials with the basic steps. So for example, the page that Wendy is showing now shows tells you how you define a team on the platform, which is a central concept for uh, Open Green Map. Um, and uh, in Get Started with Mapping, we show people how to create their first map. So what Wendy did earlier, uh, choosing your icon set, the geometry. Uh, we have a few other tutorials about adding uh, data to your map, about creating campaigns, how to embed the map in your website. So we already have quite some content, but uh, we are very much open to having people try it out and let us know if um, there are still things, details they want to add or workflows that they are interested in, in order to enrich this resource. So currently it's a docs.gis collective. Do you want to put that in the, in the chat? Mm -hmm. Definitely, we we're looking for feedback on that. I also want to say um, something else that's new. Wait a minute. Where is my slideshow? Too many windows. Ah, okay. Um, I'll just share one more second and let you know that starting next week, uh-oh, I'm going to be a, hanging out on Zoom for an hour at a time, and I'll we'll start. We'll try and find a regular time for it. But I'll try next week the first time, one o'clock New York time on um, Wednesday, and I'm just hanging out there. Come and talk to me if you've got a question. And we'll see if there's demand for more organized um, time like this. Um, but we really encourage you to come and check out new.opengreenmap.org, make a login. There's, as you saw, the brand new, oh, oh, I put the wrong URL on this new doc, sorry. Um, Pay no attention to that. <laughs> the correct URL will be in the um, in the chat. But there's more than one way. Sorry, to oops, where am I going? More than one way place where you can see information. There's videos under tutorial. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing because I'm making a mess of this. Ah, anybody got questions? <laughs> Neil. I bogged down. That was really interesting. Where you showed the the spreadsheet um, of the you know the representation of the data. Is that see when you did if you did an export of the data, that's basically what you would export from the from the site. Um. So, on the on the first sheet that you have when you open this view, you'll see all the um, general information about your site, like name, description, location, and so on. Um, and if you add icons that have certain attributes, you'll see them as separate tabs uh, underneath. But if you don't define your custom data as icon attributes, we have some tutorial about this. We can talk more if you want to. Um, you won't see the data on the sheet. Okay, so, but so it, my, then my question is, could you, is it possible to upload on mass, you know, a hundred sites from a spreadsheet? Yes, we also have an import feature. We yeah. improved it um, um, at the end of the last year and you can import CSV files and GeoJSONs. And we have a view that helps you to match fields from your file to our platform. So you won't need to um, uh, customize it on your local machine if it doesn't work. It, it might look a little bit advanced, but it's not that scary. You get a preview of the data before you import it. And if you have any issues with it, just uh, contact us and we'll try to help. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I mean, this is a, a conversation that we've been having about, you know, at what point do you share the data and in what format? And uh, I mean, ideally, you know, everybody would get all the data and everyone would have access, but we know that uh, kids in the field, for example, may be putting in uh, grossly inaccurate data or even sort of 
you know, kind of flaming the data in some way. And so there needs to be a vetting process where we say, okay, this is legitimate data before we, re we release it to the general public. Or we uh, invite kids across our watershed, you know, kids, they might be 1700 miles apart, sharing those data sets in order to perform different kinds of operations like averaging pH, for, for example, or something like that. But we definitely want to get down to the comma separated values spreadsheets that are kind of commonly used formats that could be easily shared. Um, yeah, for sure. And in terms of this review process, uh, when you open a campaign, you can opt in for having uh, sites added as pending initially, and they will uh, show up on the page on, on your map, but nobody will be able to see the details of that site until it's reviewed by a map maker, because sometimes you want to filter out it, uh, inaccurate uh, data and if everything is fine you just publish it and everything will be um, will be on that map so i love that new pending thing it's really because then people who put things up with a campaign or participating in a group process have the satisfaction of seeing it on the map but people cannot click it open and read it until you've checked it and made sure it's okay. And I really like that. Claire? I just wanted to ask, um, if you go in and you set up a map for your uh, town or village, is there um, anything that can prevent somebody from coming in and seeing what you've done and then overwriting your map with their own one? Overwrite. So, so um, yeah. a, a map is owned by your by a team. So if you make your own team and you create uh, a map with it, only people in that team have access to edit, uh, view private data on the map. No one else can overwrite any data on your own map. Uh, I, I I meant more with the thing like if I go in and um, say map everything in Norwich, for example, and then. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 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 put, put a campaign out on social media asking the general public to come in and you know populate it with with things that they found um it, is there anything to st like say stop the council for example seeing what's going on and going oh actually we don't want claire to have ownership of that we want to have ownership of that and then coming in and setting up their own one so in effect you've got two maps trying to do the same thing because i can see that uh you know that at the moment this is all there as open source and that's I can see that some unscrupulous people are going to perhaps try and um, you know use it for their own monetary gain is there anything mm -hmm. to, to prevent that from happening mm -hmm. so um, the platform is currently administered by Wendy mainly uh, she has rights to um, um, inquire further with um, uh, map makers about their goals uh, and to take the data uh, off the platform if it is inappropriate or um, if it's not well intended. <laughs> so we do have an, an administrator um, level. Uh, and in this case, uh, Wendy will make the decision. And can't you set your license yourself and say, you can put a warning up there if you want it, or you, you can. Yes, so in terms also, of data ownership, you can for your map say, this is the license, so no one else can copy it or anyone can reuse it, uh, but this is what you do at your own maps level. So this doesn't control what anyone else can come and um, create another map in the same village and trying to overwrite or add their own places. I, I think we are also, the approach is that it is about community mapping. So uh, we would try to uh, mediate and try to understand if there can be any collaboration between different communities who want to map in a certain area. I think it's it's about a conversation. It's about um, yeah, how people and get I, along. And I know when my, data, this is years ago, showed up on a map in a magazine. I was like, oh, look, they're quoting me without crediting me. 
<laughs> and I went ahead and took some of the sites they had up and added into our map. So, you know, you have to think, you know, are we, is this helping us all move somewhere together to a greener, more climate smart community? Mary has had a lot of experience in this. Let's see what she has well, to say. it's because we're in such a small area on the peninsula here, um, there's a lot of overlapping of needs. And I'm working with, you know, three different food type people that are focused on that. And everybody wants to own their own map. But for here, when I have one site and it's updated, that site can go on several different maps. So you update one, all the maps are updated at the same time. So the people with a food map library, they just wanted their own little map over here. And the other guy wanted the whole city thing on their map, but the site is on both. So it's kind of like one site play nice on both and then everybody's kind of happy. Um, also, it takes a lot of work. This is really more of an engagement tool. It's more of a marketing question. If you have a girl like social media, if you've got everybody following you, you own the map. <laughs> you know? And if you have two people starting something new, they're going to go away eventually. So don't even worry about it. So it's all about you know, the engagement of it and your um, intent, I think, is going to keep you on top of stuff. And but, Go ahead. I was just going to say, Mary created a really wonderful uh, video on how to use the search. And it's aimed at student users. And it's in that it's on that greenmap.org slash cop26 page. So you can see it. I think yours is the first one up in the group of videos we showed there. So um, we might pull that out separately too, because it's really useful for if you're working with young people, especially. Did you want to add something else, Mary? No. Neil asked the other day, can you put the same site on two maps but show a different primary icon? No. You can't, but you can co basically copy paste and quickly have a second site with the second icon. And we like here, for example, Union Square has sometimes eight different icons on it because there's so much going on between the farmer's market and the restoration work and, you know, different aspects that the public might be interested in that we might show it on different maps from different perspectives. Another minute or two, and if there's another couple questions, and then we'll wrap up for today. Well, one of the things I like is how fast it is to start the map and get it out there. And that the, the data can move around, that the, you know, the map is a, can be a moment in time or it can be a continuum. So I'll just leave that with you. I don't think we had any other things we wanted to add, Bogdan and Alexandra, or did we? Oh, oh, can I say one exciting thing we learned from the Glasgow map that's apropos to this conversation? They shared the embed code and it was in many websites. So lots of people could access the map, always updated without going to a specific website. They'd see it in different places. And I think that is a really neat technique. We were asked about analytics and we don't, didn't have a good answer then, but we do now, don't we? A better answer? Yeah, we, we improved the analytics of our platform, but we are not ready to, uh, to um, enable this for the, um, all the map makers, but we are working on it and hopefully you'll soon be able to see how um, how many views your map have, has. And I will say we are looking for support for this work. If you have access to funding, if you have, want something special added, um, things like that, think about how can you um, support the work of the GIS Collective and Green Map System while you're doing it. It's great being open source and love working this way. But that also means everybody has to help keep things afloat at the same time. So we appreciate that. And your ideas are most welcome in that regard. And we're continuing to stay focused on, um, to me, this is really interesting. We have so many academic folks here connected with long-term projects in different communities. I'm thrilled about that. And how, how this tool, these tools can help you succeed locally helps all of us succeed globally. 
So I really appreciate everybody's efforts here. Everybody good for today? No more questions? Everybody saying goodbye? Yeah, many thanks. Yeah. Thank you Thank all. You. This was yeah. great. Thank you. Just, yeah. I'll be See up there next soon. Wednesday. See you there and contact us anytime you want help or you have questions. We really do appreciate your feedback. Thank you. This was great. Thanks, Thank Wendy. You. Thanks, Bogdan. Thanks, Alexander. Bye. Bye. Bye.